Welcome to Legal Toolkit, bringing you the latest legal trends and business initiatives to help you manage your law firm with your host, Jared Correa. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello, my friends, and welcome to yet another episode of the award-winning one and only Legal Toolkit podcast here on the Legal Talk Network. If you're looking for a DVD copy of season one of Quantum Leap, perchance, I'm your guy. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a first-time listener, hopefully you'll become a long-time listener. And if you're the kid from So I Marry an Axe Murderer, you have a gigantic head. As always, I'm your show host, Jared Correa. And in addition to casting this pod, I'm the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, which offers subscription-based law practice management consulting services for law firms, bar associations, and legal vendors. Check us out at redcavelegal.com. I'm also the COO of Gideon Software, Inc., which offers chatbots, a first-to-market chatbot builder, and predictive analytics created specifically for law firms. Find out more at www.gideon.legal. You can also listen to my other other podcast. Yes, I have another one called The Lobby List. It's a family travel show I host with my delightful wife, Jessica, and that's on iTunes. Subscribe, rate, and or comment. But here on The Legal Toolkit, we provide you with a new tool each episode to add to your own legal toolkit so that your practices will become more and more like best practices. And in this episode, we're going to talk about using artificial intelligence to improve legal research, a topic near and dear to my heart. But before we do so, before I introduce today's guest, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors, without whom there would be no show. Abby Connect has delivered premium live receptionist and answering services to lawyers since 2006. You can try them out for free at abbyconnect.com. Scorpion crushes the standard for law firm online marketing with proven campaign strategies to get attorneys better cases from the internet. Partner with Scorpion to get an award-winning website and ROI-positive marketing programs today. Visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast. Nexa, formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800-267-9371 or online at www.nexa.com. TimeSolve is the number one web-based time and billing software for lawyers, providing solutions since 1999. TimeSolve provides the most comprehensive billing features for law firms big and small. www.timesolve.com All right, my guest today is Thomas Hamilton, the Vice President of Strategy and Operations at Ross Intelligence. Thomas was trained at Denton's, the world's largest law firm, and before that attended many prestigious educational institutions in Canada and France, none of which I can pronounce. Thomas, welcome to the big show. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. You're decorated, my friend. It's impressive. That's one way of putting it. <laughs> I also found enjoyment in the fact that I caused you to YouTube several classic films when you read the script for this podcast episode. So this weekend, you're going to watch So I Married an Expert on DVD that I'll send you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And I have to brush up on some of my early Mike Myers yeah, we'll work on that. We can work on that together. I think we've broken the ice a little bit, but I always like to do an icebreaker question to start. Like, can I say that I think you have a really cool name? <laughs> Thank you. I think you have a cool name. Oh, really? Your name is there's a lot of gravitas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, you should talk to my kids because they don't feel that way. A lot of vowels. It's hard to spell. But you, man, you sound like you're one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Like, that's pretty dope. So I have a question for you, two-part question. Yeah. If you were actually able to be one of the American founding fathers, which one would you choose? And since you're a Canadian, I'm going to offer you an out. You could also just tell me about a Canadian dude or lady that you really like. Okay, so I'm going to give a two-part answer. I just nice. saw Hamilton. <laughs> I just saw Hamilton. Which like, was named after you. We should tell people that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I saw it like three weeks ago, and I thought it was incredible in, uh, in San Francisco. So... Yeah definitely kind of biased, you know, the way I'm leaning, but I'm going to go with Hamilton if, if we're allowed to count him. Yeah, good call. That works. Could never be president, but that's all right. No, and, and he's, you know, like he's, he's got the cool intellectual. He was, you know, would, would write like crazy, super opinionated and sort of a pacifist, but also war hero at the same time. Like he was a very cool kind of millennial hero in my mind. Like, I don't think it's an accident that that play came out at the time it did. Uh, and, and is so well written as well. So I'm going to go with Hamilton. 
Well played. Thank you. <laughs> Partially because of my name. <laughs> uh, and I think from the Canadian side, I would say Pierre Trudeau, because I, I really admired how he sort of was able to keep different parts of the country, you know, working together, despite a, a lot of a lot of difficulties in doing it. And he was he was an intellectual guy. He was a, he was a really cool, smart, worldly guy. But he was, you know, he wasn't above sort of just working with the average Canadian and, and helping people understand their differences and work together, which to me is, that's a very Canadian style kind of founding father, if you will. Mm. I didn't think Canadians had differences. I just thought if there was like a potential argument, they would just be really nice to each other and then there'd be no more argument. No, that's, that's just the whole, that's sort of our national PR campaign. It's like, oh. you know, like behind, behind the curtains, like we're arguing, but we just got to look very friendly to everyone else. Oh, interesting. So I went to Canada, like dudes are just beating the hell out of each other behind Tim Hortons. Oh yeah. It's like, it's like the Lord of the Flies basically. Wow. Wow. All right. I'm going <laughs> to stay in the U.S. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the real stuff, right? Legal research, artificial intelligence. So I've heard of this thing, artificial intelligence. It seems to be a big deal. I read about it in my New Yorker. It seems modern and exciting. So can you tell us a little bit about what artificial intelligence is and means? Yeah, sure thing. So I'm going to give the definition that really worked for me when I was exposed to this stuff. You know, I, I didn't come from a typical tech background. I was, I was a lawyer. Like you said, I was, I was trained at Denton's. And I, I worked around a lot of our tech clients, but I didn't come from, you know, a coding background or anything like that. So the way it was explained to me by the AI engineers and AI co-founders at our company is artificial intelligence is software that can do something that we thought only a human could do. Pause. I like that. Yeah. Full, pause, so, full stop, or will pause, we continue? Full stop. Well, okay. pause, half stop, because <laughs> the, the power of that definition, like why it works so well is that. I think it illustrates in a nice way how it's always a moving target, right? So what I think is something only a human could do is not the same as what my, my nephew, when he comes to my age, will, will think. And what, you know, in, in my mid-30s, I think of as like, you know, something that, that only a human can do is totally different from what my father thought, you know, like when, when he was in, uh, in university. So AI is a moving target. It always evolves. And, and a simple example of this is, Remember like when Siri came out, right, for the iPhone 4S? That was sort of mind-blowing tech that you could talk to a phone. That was a great example of simple speech recognition. Now that's, that's totally just table stakes. No one would call that artificial intelligence anymore. But really just a few years ago, that was groundbreaking AI. And it shows how quickly the field evolves. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. All right, so let's take a moment to talk about what AI is not, right? So what is probably the major misconception about AI? So I think the biggest thing that, that we come across, you know, based off the work we do and, and, and chatting with lawyers with the tech we have, is people confuse 2019 AI, which is narrow applications of artificial intelligence, with all-powerful omniscient AI, which is also known as general artificial intelligence, which is, may never be possible, but even if it is, it is extremely far into the future away from us. So to differentiate, narrow applications, it's an AI system, software system that can do one thing really, really well. That's basically it. Usually it can do that thing so well that it can outperform a human based on some simple metrics. And you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll dive into that stuff later on in, in the podcast. But to differentiate that, general AI is like the sort of the, the HAL in 2001 Space Odyssey. It's the, it's the sort of like omniscient unifying source code that can that can do everything a human can do at the same time we are light years away from ever attaining that so i think that's the biggest misconception we hear where you see a lot of hyperbole in the press right now yeah no i think that's a good point like this is partly related to like this traditional narrative which is like man versus machine man versus ai i mean this is like john henry stuff this is like bobby fisher versus deep blue so yep. And, and we will definitely dive into that in more. So let's, let's try to tie this into legal. So like, where are we in artificial intelligence adoption, the life cycle for legal tech firms? Let's start there. So I would say that we are, we are early, but we are thankfully past the first wave of major excitement. And we are healthily sort of into the not the full-blown trough of sort of disappointment, but the more realistic expectations. And this is not where I was expecting you to go here. No one's <laughs> well, excited no, anymore. No, listen, this is like, why I say that is that early on, and, and you know, we're, as a company, we're just over four years old, but in sort of startup land, I mean, that's, that's 
uh, startup land years are like dog years, right? So we're, we're a very established company at this point. And when we first came out and we said, we are an artificial intelligence company, like, you know, full stop, it was met with a lot of skepticism and then a lot of excitement, but it was the classic sort of like hype cycle excitement, which, which historically AI has gone through multiple times, actually. Why I say it's now sort of a more reasoned view and why I think that's good is that it's gone from it's AI, it must be good, which is not the case, to let's evaluate this tool just like any other tool. And if these claims of the killer AI algorithms powering it are true, well, then surely this tool will outperform other stuff on the market. It'll be easy to use, more powerful and more affordable. And that's, that's the sort of healthy mindset that attorneys should have in evaluating any technology, not just AI technology. Reasonableness is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> you're, just, you're just trying to get the Jerry Springer answers from me, you know? I know. I want some controversy. I'm trying to get downloads, man. Come on. <laughs> no, but I think, you're, I think you're right about that. Like, the more lawyers can view this as like an assistive technology, I think, which is something we'll talk about moving forward like the better they'll be to adopt it. And then, um, you know, they're going to start making more reasonable decisions about it, just like they would about any other technology. I think ultimately that's a good thing for companies like yours. All right, I've spent. Let's break. And then we come back after some more words from our sponsors. Your legal work requires your full attention. So how can you build lasting relationships with new or existing clients while juggling your caseload? Try Abby Connect, the friendly, highly trained, and motivated live receptionists who are well known for providing consistent quality customer service and support to law firms just like yours. Every connection matters. So call Abby Connect today at 833 Abby Wow to get started with your free 14 day trial and $95 off your first bill. Do you feel like your marketing efforts aren't getting you the high value cases your firm deserves? For over 15 years, Scorpion has helped thousands of law firms just like yours to attract new cases and to grow their practices. As a Google Premier Partner and winner of Google's Platform Innovator Award, Scorpion has the right resources and technology to aggressively market your law firm and to generate better cases from the internet. For more information, visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast today. Hey everyone, thanks for coming back. I've returned. I was just binging Pioneer Woman with my daughter. That's her favorite show. Shout out to her. But now let's get back to our conversation with Thomas Hamilton, founding father and member of the Ross Intelligence team. We're talking about the use of artificial intelligence in legal research. So let's turn to that specific topic, which we haven't addressed. So I feel like a lot of the, the majority, frankly, the innovation in terms of machine learning and artificial intelligence takes place in the legal research space right now. I mean, broadly, your company and others. That's where I see like real innovation. So A, do you agree? And B, why are legal research providers so well positioned to build AI solutions versus like other legal tech companies? So I, I agree with the first half, but not with the second half. And I'll, I'll, oh, I'll go into why. Okay. So Controversy, that's what I'm talking about. Here we go, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so look, so Jared, you are right when you say that companies focusing on legal research have a lot of interesting use cases for AI. That is absolutely true. And specifically, the use case that we're talking about is for what's known as natural language processing, which has in legal research almost the, the perfect sort of use case. The idea that... Can you talk a little bit about what that is so people know? I don't know if everybody knows what that is. Absolutely. Okay, so... Basically, an NLP system is the idea where you can pose a complex, context-specific question to the AI system in the same way or the same format. You might pose that question to a human expert, and the AI system will return only highly relevant, on-point, context-specific responses. So a, a sort of breakthrough moment in the last 10 years in this for, for any Jeopardy fans that are, that are listening is when IBM's Watson supercomputer beat the two reigning you know, human Jeopardy champions. And why that was so exciting from, from sort of an AI geek you know, point of view for, for us was that that was a, a wonderful, very controlled, but wonderful example of, of how good NLP, natural language processing systems, had become. The AI system received the same complex, frankly, kind of confusing 
questions, exact same format that the two human experts, literally the, the two best Jeopardy players in the world received, and then returned more timely and more accurate on-point answers than they did. So there's a lot of parallels with that and with legal research, right? The so, real question is, could the computer beat James, most recent Jeopardy champion? We shall see. We shall see. We shall see. And, and that, incidentally, goes into the fun thing of, just like we saw with chess, and, and will likely occur with Go as well, it's sort of the concept of, of centaur chess, right? So like, if the, the absolute best human champion, can they then lose to a pretty decent champion, human and a really good AI system? And vice versa, like, can a pretty good human with a, a decent AI system totally, you know, beat the bejesus out of the best natural language processing <laughs> system? Gotcha. And now for the second part of your answer. Right, okay, so the second part. Second part is, so there are companies focusing on legal research that have great AI pedigrees. To be honest, it's not an even playing field because you need to have started from the ground up as an AI company to really be able to reap the benefits of what's possible right now. Some of the, the more established players that have been out there for a long time started more as publishing companies, right? Or as Boolean search companies. So their expertise doesn't really lie in AI, nor does their tech stack allow for them to easily pivot into some AI search. But what they are very good at is all the other stuff. And so that's sort of the segue into the companies that are best poised to benefit from AI moving forward. I think it, you're going to see, and this is kind of a spoiler, but like, you're going to see more and more collaboration than you might be used to in legal tech. Typically, legal tech is very siloed, and that's typical of, of young tech markets. But as the tech markets mature, you see this in, in a million different examples, you're going to see more and more collaboration. So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. We work very closely with Clio, right? So I'm sure a number of you are, are familiar with them. You know, I've before. heard of that company. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've heard of them before once or twice. So, so Clio does a number of things very well, but you know, if you boil it down to a few points, it's a great CRM and great practice management software. They don't touch legal research, but the odds are very good that if you're a small, small firm attorney or a solo and you use Clio because it helps you streamline a lot of sort of the more business sides of your practice, well, the odds are very good that you would also benefit from a tool like ours, which would help streamline le your, your legal research. So I think... Legal research companies are doing some of the coolest cutting edge stuff on the AI front, but you're going to see some really interesting collaboration happen as well as the stuff goes more and more mainstream. I think those are all great points. And this notion of like being in AI to start and taking full advantage is sort of similar to when you saw these cloud-based platforms mm -hmm. develop. Like anytime you see a company move from premise-based to cloud, it's almost a disaster. Yeah. And if you start in the cloud, you're already there and you have a significant advantage. All right, so let's move to actual lawyers, right? So I asked about AI adoption in the legal tech space in the last segment. How about law firms? Like to what level are law firms starting to utilize AI, including like smaller law firms? So the first movers were large law firms. And we, we saw that, and in many ways kind of started that trend a few years ago. And that makes sense, right? Large law firms have the budget to have a full-time chief information officer, chief knowledge officer, chief technology officer, and to fly them around uh, the country, to fly them to Europe, to fly them over to Asia, to attend conferences. So they were the most aware of what was happening in, in, in AI. They, they really were. But something that has then evolved since then is sort of the arrival of what, what we call plug-and-play AI solutions. So this is stuff that is not built for a firm with a million-dollar budget a year. It's stuff that is affordable for, for any size of firm, you know, for, for solos, and is something that you can learn to use in minutes, requires no installation, no on-prem, no tagging your own data, anything like that. And as that sort of has, has arrived on the scene, I think that we've seen a very, very substantial uptick in terms of certainly how our technology is used by small firms and, and solos. And, and I think why that matters is, A, there's an access to just settlement because really those are the attorneys that provide legal services to the overwhelming majority of Americans. It's, it's not the, the mega firms like, like where I was. They do very important work, but your clients are the Fortune 500. It's also the majority of attorneys in the country are small and solos. And to me, the litmus test that your AI tech is, is powerful is no matter how sophisticated what you built is on the back end, someone should be able to use it in two seconds. And 
what we're starting to see, and it goes back to where I was talking about like the, the AI adoption cycle, we've crested that, that wave where it was just, it's AI, it must be cool. Now it's, this thing has to literally deliver value right away. And typically small firms and solos are probably a bit more mature in how they evaluate tech for that. So I think we're really hitting the sweet spot now where, where you're seeing small and solos really adopt AI. It's going to keep happening, but the wave is already building now. All right, let's segue from that to talk about like how those law firms who haven't tried AI yet, like the litmus test firms, right? Mm -hmm. Those solo and small firm attorneys, if they want to get into this, but they have no clue about it, what's like some low risk, low effort ways to at least try to utilize an AI system or part of one? Yeah, so I, I might get, you know, dirty looks from members of sales teams at some other companies, but I think any <laughs> any good AI tech, like they should make their product available for you to, to trial for free with basically no strings attached. It should be like signing up for Netflix, if not easier. If they're doing that, then it's in their interest to make sure it's easy to use their product. Not only easy to use it, but easy to like understand what it does. So I would say that there's a few good resources to learn about that. You know, you can Google, there's, there's different folks like, uh, you know, Bob Ambrosi's Law Sites, there's different folks cover it. Clio has a great summary they release every year. Law Geeks has done one a few times, it's great too. But the AI tech that's out there that's going to help you, you should be able to sign up and trial and, and, and use right away. Also, now that this stuff is really showing its value, it's now in law schools. So today, just a few hours ago, we went live with our .edu signup. So that means that any student or any member of law faculty can sign up for free unlimited use of our tech on our website. That means that when we do talk at law schools, and you know, we get invited pretty regularly to talk about this stuff, literally we'll have the entire class sign up like in front of us on their laptops. So when you hire that summer student or when you're working across from opposing counsel, They'll already be familiar with some of the AI tech that's out there because once again, it should be that easy to try and use and understand. Yes, Bob Ambrosi, my grandfather, is a tremendous legal tech writer. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bob, I had to. Um, okay, let's take our second and last show break while I try to figure out what's eating Gilbert Grape. Listen to these words from our sponsors. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexus virtual receptionists are available 24-7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm's software, and much, much more. Nexus ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a very special offer. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients. At TimeSolve, our attorneys save on average over eight hours a month in billing work. That means more billable time and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at timesolve.com. That's www.timesolv, leave off the e, dot com. Remember, that's T-I-M-E-S-O-L-V dot com. All right, thanks for hanging around. Part three, we've made it. I didn't have any better offers either. Guess what? We're still talking with Thomas Hamilton of Ross Intelligence, who's been educating us on how artificial intelligence can be used to improve legal research by small firms, solos, big firms, law students. Let's find out more. All right, Thomas, how can AI in legal research function as a training tool for new lawyers? Or can it? Because I think a lot of people out there think the reason you do AI research is to replace the efforts of new attorneys. Okay. So I'm going to get more controversial with you because I know you yes. want to kind of raise the temperature. All right. Yes. Coming in hot in here. I think that this is absolutely not going to replace junior lawyers or the work they do. And the reason for that is because there's sort of a fallacy in how we value entry-level legal work. I think a lot of what I took out of law school, while I really enjoyed law school, and a lot of what I took out of my early training at, at my firm, and I really enjoyed that training too, there was a philosophy, unfortunately, and it was basically that you learn about shovels by digging a lot of ditches. Nice. <laughs> and the, the issue is, you know, there was almost this thing of you have to pay your dues. Like if you haven't spent, you know, four or five weekends just stuck with your, with your nose in books or hammering away on Boolean search terms on legal research, then you don't understand how it works and therefore you don't understand how the law works. 
And I, I think that's incorrect. And it's like, it's almost a little bit, you know, masochistic of us, which is totally something lawyers do. What our tech lets you do, and what a lot of AI tech lets you do is it gets rid of some of the things that we're terrible at, like staring at a screen for hours and hours, and gets you to the things we're good at, which is putting you in front of passages directly from case law that you analyze, you do the creative thinking about, but that we know through AI algorithms, answer your question. So AI overall, it doesn't replace you and your lawyers. It streamlines the work they do and lets them spend more time on the high value added kind of tasks, which is what we all went to law school to do anyways. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like that. It brings a small tear to my eye. All right. <laughs> I've grilled you enough about AI. Let's enter the potpourri section. Of this our is show. my favorite part of podcast, by the way. This is going to be really good, like the random questions. So how will, Mr. Hamilton, the landscape change in legal the most in the next five years? So in legal tech, you're going to see that consolidation. You're going to see the further emergence of like platforms that really aggregate a number of different tools. Clio is a really good example of that already, but I think that you're going to see that increase more and more. You're going to get almost like a Salesforce-esque situation. So that's from legal tech, I think. And I think in the world of legal overall, it remains to be seen. Like the last few years, everyone's been saying the AMLAW firms are going to totally fall apart. It's going to be the hollowing out of the middle. We've seen that a bit, but I mean, the really elite firms are, are making more money than ever. I do think that small and solos are going to be able to do more than ever possible before because of what AI is going to allow them to do. So in that way, you'll see almost like a reversion to maybe 50 years ago or 70 years ago, where it wasn't the small firms just getting totally frozen out of larger mandates. AI is going to give more power back to those smaller firms that want to take on the big firm type of mandates. Oh, you're spot on on consolidation. I, I think many pricing attorneys don't even know that's happening. What's one piece of advice you have for our audience on any legal related subject? And if you would like, feel free to also give a piece of life advice. Wow. Okay. Hmm. No pressure. All right. Life advice. If you're going to order poutine, make sure the cheese curds are fatty enough that they squeak like a mouse when you eat them. <laughs> I'm so glad you went in this direction. I have a surprise for you in a second. But okay, go ahead. Great. Okay, so that's the life advice. Uh, the legal advice is, I think it ties back to, to, to what's going to happen in legal tech. And that, that's just the world I'm in. So it's com what comes to mind. We're really entering the golden age of legal tech. Legal tech used to be a very sort of slow, insular part of the tech world overall. But now because what's happening in AI, and like we talked about earlier in the podcast, what is possible with natural language processing and how perfectly that applies to case law research. Legal tech is really attack, attracting really sort of the best and the brightest, like people that otherwise would go to Amazon, to Facebook, to, to Google. And that means you're going to see very powerful products come out, but products that are designed around the same design principles that, you know, Apple uses when they create a MacBook or when they make an iPhone. These are, this is tech that's very easy to use, powerful to use, and you can basically use coming out of the box. And I would really encourage you to, to try it out. Okay. After I ask this question, I just need you to confirm that you'd had no idea this was coming because it relates to your last answer. Okay. This is one of my new favorite segments in the show. It's called That Tweet You Forgot About, in which I read back to you a Twitter post you made and you oh, comment yeah. on it. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm, I'm worried, but I'm ready. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you're ready because that was a rhetorical question I was going to ask anyway. Are you ready for this? It's going to be crazy. November 21st, Less than a week ago, you, tweet, you tweeted, it wouldn't be a Canadian consulate event in San Francisco without a solid poutine <laughs> station. And you just <laughs> talked about poutine, not knowing this question would be asked. So here's my follow-up question for you. I feel like we've got the simpatico thing going right now. For the uninitiated, can you tell people what poutine is? And then I would like to hear your take on tolerance for variations on the standard formula. Okay. So, and I'm going to apologize in advance to any Canadian listeners from Eastern Ontario or Quebec that may correct me, but that's fine. We're going to build more controversy here for listeners, Jared. All right. <laughs> yes. Excellent. So poutine, my understanding is that there are three towns around Quebec City, which all claim to be sort of the originator of, of poutine in the same way that you know, like different styles of barbecue in different parts of the United States, there's different areas that like would have claimed, you know, that the mustard based sauce, you know, came right. out of like this town, that kind of thing. 
So the core concept is it's very simple. So it's, it's French fries covered in gravy, which is then covered in cheese curds. And cheese curds are the very fatty little pieces, kind of like the size of popcorn. They almost look like popcorn of pure cheese. Typically, it's sort of a cheddar or I guess kind of a mozzarella and like a very salty, fatty grade of that type of cheese. So that's that's like the textbook answer, but then it gets very finicky. And, and I use like the barbecue example again, right? Because <laughs> everyone knows at a high level barbecue is, but then it gets very political. So from there, there's these three towns, like I said, that's my understanding. But then it gets very regional in Quebec and certainly in the rest of Canada. And like West Coast is a whole other thing and da, da, da. And like I've actually had a really good poutine in, in New York. That's It's spreading down there for sure. Where I grew up in Ottawa, nation's capital but smaller than Montreal, which is two hours east, and smaller than Mont- uh, Toronto, which is sort of five hours southwest. Generally, the view is the fry should be thick cut, like those fat, sort of like the, the, the same size and dimension as like sort of your, your middle finger. And Steak fries, cut. we call those Steak in the fries. US. Yeah. yeah, like and very fried. So like they get kind of that dark text, like, like a chip wagon fry, you know what I mean? Yep. And then generally dark gravy so like a dark beef gravy and super super fatty like i said squeak when you bite them they're so fatty uh, <laughs> cheese curds but there's a there's another school of thought i would say not as legitimate but i'd say like you know 70 percent, 30 percent legitimate split of it can be a lighter gravy like a light brown gravy and it, it can actually be thinner fries elgin street diner which is right by parliament hill in ottawa does a great job of that so everyone would kind of agree on what I said to this point. From there, though, the variation is like hyper political. So mm. to me, I'm a purist. Like you eat poutine after like skating on the Ottawa Canal, building a snowman. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's snowing outside. I mean, it could, be, it could be the same thing in Massachusetts, right? Like the beautiful New England winter. We're just drinking maple syrup. <laughs> just drinking maple syrup. Yeah, exactly. The thing is, if you're not living in that kind of weather the meal I described is like pretty heavy. Like, you know, if you're like sitting on a beach in San Diego, I don't know if you want to eat the kind of poutine I grew up eating. Right. So that's where you see more variation. There's some simple stuff, like a little bit of like, you know, onion on top, that kind of thing. But it can get, it can get crazy. Uh, Montreal is big on smoked meat, which is like, what well, that's like corned beef, right? And um, yeah. if you're like yeah. cats or something in New York, that works, it's still heavy. But now that it's expanded more, look, when something you love gets shared with a lot of people, Jared, you no longer have ownership of it in the same way. And <laughs> right. there's this a lot is of- just like when I founded Netflix. <laughs> exactly. It's like when you founded Netflix. Exactly. <laughs> the age old story, right? So right. <laughs> when you founded Netflix, it was about sharing DVDs with friends of yours and you'd like mail it to each other. And now it's not, you know, now they spend like a billion dollars on every movie. So poutine has changed. It's evolved. And ultimately, we have to celebrate that. But for me, I'm, I'm a purist at heart. And that's where that tweet came from. In like a moment of nostalgia, you know, a six hour flight away from where I grew up at this, you know, cool, very debonair sort of consulate party in San Francisco, where I was like, of course, there's great poutine. You've made it, but it's bittersweet. I understand. Exactly. That, that's perfect. Yeah. It's like you've outgrown the town where you grew up, but you had to sacrifice something to get to the big city and maybe it was worth it. Maybe it wasn't. I like how we talked about AI for like half an hour and your most discursive, longest, most emotional response was to the question about poutine. <laughs> I must practice answering that one. This puts like a nice bow <laughs> on the show. <laughs> and so to that point, we've reached the end of yet another episode of the Legal Toolkit podcast. This was a podcast about AI and legal research and poutine. And we've been talking with Thomas Hamilton of Ross Intelligence. Now, I'll be back on for future shows with further insights into my soul, the soul of America, and the legal market. If you're feeling nostalgic for my dulcet tones, however, you can check out our show archive, our whole show archive, anytime you want at LegalTalkNetwork.com. So thanks again to Thomas Hamilton of Ross Intelligence for making an appearance as my guest today and for being a good sport. All right, Thomas, uh, can you tell everyone how they can find out more about you and about Ross? Yeah, sure. Thanks. We make it really easy to learn more about me and my, my tweets about poutine as well as AI. Feel free to, to follow me on Twitter. I'm a really active tweeter. So my handle is TJ Hammy. That's T-J-H-A-M-M-Y on Twitter. And then to learn more about our, our company and, and what we do, 
just Google rossintelligence.com, R-O-S-S space intelligence. I mean, you can read about us. We explain how the product works, but I'd really encourage you to just sign up, trial it, and use it as much as you want. And all you have to do when you go to the main page is going to be a button on the top right in blue. It says sign up. Click there. Put in your email address. We'll get you signed up. You can use it for 14 days unlimited. If you want a little bit more time, that's fine. Let us know. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like as well. It's all been built off of attorney feedback. First, sort of the founding teams, myself and, and our CEO, as we've grown more attorneys. But now we really do run like a Silicon Valley company. We build it off the feedback we get directly from users. So we'd love to hear what you think. And like I said, all you have to do is go to rossintelligence.com to sign up. Thanks again. That's Thomas Hamilton of Ross Intelligence. And finally, thanks to all of you out there for continuing to listen. This has been the Legal Toolkit Podcast, where the wild things are. Thanks for listening to Legal Toolkit, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join host Jared Correa for his next podcast covering the current business trends for law firms. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.